Hi everyone, it's Jerry. I have an excellent game to share with you from the ongoing TP Sigmund and Company tournament. This is a round two game between two very talented top 10 juniors on the white end, Digu Kesh, and he's up against Vincent Keimer. Digu Kesh is knocking on the door of a world's top 10. Very patient play by both players in this one. Rui Lopez on board. For a few moves in this game, Black has the option to take on e4, and in each case, the reply d4 is good. Trying to open the position while the Black King is still in the center. Black goes for the Archangel variation. When given a kick, White opts for the more active deployment, the more active post for the Bishop, rather than defend e4 directly. White says, I have a trick up my sleeve in cases where you might bite on e4. First, d6, d4, bishop b6. Now, in my introduction, when I said very patient play, I had an image in mind, and it is these guys right here. Note this tension and how long it's present in this game. Why is it present for so long? Well, neither side feels that they are benefiting by releasing the tension. Around move 12, we're going to have a closer look at the different paths this game could have taken should one side or the other have released the tension. For now, more development. Bishop e3. I said that white has a trick up his sleeve. This guy does. In the event of knight takes e4, white would have bishop d5. Both of these are hanging. There's a fork. White wins a piece. So this guy's poison. Black castles, knight b to d2, rook e8, hinting at a possible capture on d4, and then knight takes e4. Still no problem for white. He goes with h3. This would not be a good decision for black to chop away and then take on e4 because white does not care if it is a knight or rook on e4. You're still getting forked. Okay. White's still cool on e4. With h3, he's stopping any knight g4. Bishop's more secure. White enjoys the flight square as well. Black says, I too can play that game. I got my flight square. This game feels very much like a game of inches, like we're observing a, uh, a jujitsu match. Each side for many moves in this game is slowly trying to improve their position while at the same time not giving an inch, not extending their arm, not leaving themselves vulnerable, for example, to an arm bar. Slow, methodical play. In this game, it's queen e2, rook b8. With these last two moves, each side is in a position to recapture on e3 or b6. The dark square bishops are secure with pieces. Now, instead of rook to b8, this is where I want to highlight one of the structural changes, and it kicks off with black's decision. What's going to happen if black releases the tension? How might play follow if black, instead of playing rook b8, captured on d4? This is how play could continue. Knight a5, hitting the bishop, so that this guy could contribute to challenging white's Pawn duo. I'm going to take it out just a hair further. There's an instinctual error I made in preparing for this video and one of the variations, and that is after this capture, instinctually I went with the pawn as the recapture, but that's no good because after e5, the knight will have to move. However, if you first take with the bishop, these guys are exchanged. e5, this guy is pinned. This is not yet a threat, and it says after bishop b7, it's around an even position. Okay, that's one way the game could have turned. In this game, it's rook b8. Let's look at the other two. White has two options to take or push. Let's say white captures. This one's a much shorter variation. Black would recapture with the knight. Keep this as a half-open file for now. And it also frees the C pawn. In the event of 
white ducking this knight exchange, let's say tries to go to d4, hinting at f4, there would be c5. But let's say the capture, now black could recapture with the pawn, and there's no benefit. It's considered an even position here. So this is a reason to not be, not be releasing the tension as white. This guy still sticks around here on d4. What other way might it change? This is the last one, and that is to give this knight a kick to close the center. This is the uh, this is a variation where black is actually going to be the side who benefits. And let's have a closer look as to why that is the case. Now, in playing d5 as white, what might you be saying? You're saying that you're okay exchanging your good bishop for black's bad bishop. That's one way of looking at it. And here's another one. This guy right now, with the pawn on d4, you might describe this bishop as not only your good bishop, potentially, but as a two-directional bishop. It's functioning on the queen side and king side, whereas this guy right here, it's only a one-directional bishop. It sees just, just along this diagonal. This difference matters. We're going to see that this guy right here is extremely dangerous, and this is made possible because of the patience by white. The patience with this decision, this guy does not budge. White does not give black an opportunity to exchange dark square bishops. Okay, if we're to carry out this variation, why does it prefer black here? Mainly because Black is going to have an easier time activating the rooks, has an easier time getting a pawn break in with f5. Okay, in this game, tension remains. Continue to slowly build up. Computer points out you could still go for the capture, however, it's less attractive now, seeing how this rook is now opposite the queen. Okay, from here, bishop to d7. This earlier trick I was pointing out with bishop to d5, that's no longer there now that this knight is defended. This is what prompts white's next move, bishop c2. It's there to defend e4, this time directly. Okay, from here, queen c8. This is where things start to get a little bit away from black, I feel. Black's moving the queen like a king, <laughs> going to c8, going to b8, or excuse me, b7, and then making some pawn advances on the queen side. Eventually, uh, what, we're, what we're going to see in action here is black is playing on the queen side, obtaining some static pluses, whereas white is drifting towards the king side. We're going to see a knight maneuver. And the pieces are slowly starting to improve, and there's a storm brewing on the king side. Okay. Static pluses for black on the queen side, dynamic pluses for white on the king side. From here, rook f to e1, centralization, vacated square for the king knight, or excuse me, the queen knight, queen b7, a3. Again. A game of inches. You might think, you know, when you play this move, what's the natural follow-up? You play this, shouldn't now be the time you go for this maneuver? Not so fast. A3 is flicked in for two reasons. One, stop upon break B4. Two, cut out any possibility of knight B4. This guy on c3 is not a reliable defender of b4. Let's see what might happen if this knight immediately looks to, on this move 16, to go to f1. Here's how play could follow. Black could take on d4, take on e4, and after this push, d5, 
dark square bishops get exchanged, this knight has access to the b4 square. Bishop backs off, and now there's moves like knight to f6, and you could go hunting. This is a way for black to play this one. The b4 square, in short, is available to black. Okay. First, it's a3. a5, only now, knight f1. How is this different? If black in this position captures on d4. In the game, a4 is played. Let's compare this position with a3 in before moving the knight to f1. If black takes in this case, chop, chop, knight takes e4, d5, notice the difference here. What options does this guy have on c6 now? The computer says best is to go to a7. Black is up a pawn, but the quality of this knight is not very good. This is, a, this is still considered a very good position for white. Okay. From here, it's a4. More long term, if this maybe gets into an ending, the queens are maybe exchanged, this idea of the a3, b2 pawns being clamped, the a4 like this, this could be a nice positive for black, but we're a long ways away from having a queen exchange. There's an attack coming towards the black king. Knight g3, knight a5, knight h4, knight c4. Bishop is fine. Bishop on c1 is developed. It's not in the way of the queen rook. It's canceling out the knight. Still has an eye on the h6 square d5. Considered best at this stage for black is to release the tension and then go with c5. Trying to open up this square for the knight, for instance, if d5, the computer is saying to fall back here, you're going to need some defense of your king side. This is not the way uh, black plays in this position. He goes with d5. So a lot of tension now in the center. White is better prepared for this opening up of the position, better positioned with the pieces. From here, queen f3, knight to d6, and here we have the sacrifice on h6. This guy is overloaded, had two jobs. Black saw this coming. He had prepared this capture and reply, but white has seen further. Queen gets out of the way while also defending h6. Bishop is picked up. Queen takes. Notice the big difference in this position between the queens. She's way over here in left field, nowhere close to trying, uh, nowhere in position, not even close to neutralizing the white queen. In this game, rookie six as the follow up. Knight f5. I questioned. Does it matter which knight you go into the f5 square with? Um, this is the better knight to go in with. And a reason for this is to have this maneuver available. It's important to have in one of the lines uh, the g3 square open for the rook. So it's better to go with this guy first. Knight f5, knight g to f5. We are threatening... White well, was threatening mate on g7. Queen g5 check. King f8. Queen h5. I should mention that there's a couple of reasons why this move is no good. One, we could take it with the knight. And two, there's this fork on e7. So the reason I'm highlighting this is because in this position right here, when the knight drops into f5, black could have first exchanged a pair of knights. And then if black defends like this, the check still can't be met with that. We got the fork going on. Okay, in this game after knight f5, it's immediately the retreat. Knight f to e8. From here, queen g5 check. King f8. 
Queen h5, threatening mate in one. Knight takes knight, knight takes knight. Rook g6, just there in time to stop the mate. The rook is ready to block in the event of queen h8. So bishop takes e4, queen a7, and we go for a check. Only one move. Another check, knight blocks. Chop, chop, black is in a pin, and all white needs to do is take advantage of it. There are two ways you could get a rook to g3. Which one would you go for instinctually? As an attacking player, do you go with rook d3 or rook e3? Again, it doesn't matter in the computer's eyes, but I think the more human move here is this guy going to e3. And the reason I think this is because this guy maybe has in mind a capture of the bishop in some lines. It is unprotected on d7. And this guy right here, we really don't need uh, the support of the bishop on e4. Okay, either way, both are very good. Both are winning at this stage. The queen is not going to be able to assist in defending the black king. So what's tried is bishop g4. Trying to close the g-file. You could take the bishop, but even better is the move played in the game. Rook g3. And after bishop takes on d4, rook takes bishop, and that's the final move of the game. Black resigns. There's no way to defend the pinned rook. If some other move is played here, I should mention instead of bishop to g4, if the king goes to g8, uh, we could play rook to g1 still. And there's still going to be a problem here on g7. If you take the rook, we would end up with the familiar checkmate pattern, bishop h7, bishop g6 discovered, check, check, checkmate. So no good uh, answer here for black in this case. He went with bishop g4. And after rook takes g4, this one is over. So a very nice game by, again, two very, very talented top 10 juniors. Feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.